When I first learned about immunotherapy, the concept seemed so strange to me. I was just used to this idea that you're on treatment, you will feel terrible. I had started to feel not well the spring of that year. Started to develop this really gnarly cough. It didn't really occur to me that it could be, you know, cancer or anything like that. I had a giant tumor outside of, uh, out of my right lung. So when I was first diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, it was kind of pitched to me as like, you know, one of the most treatable cancers. Typically, people are done with it once they do some chemotherapy and radiation, and then they're out. They have to walk off into the sun. I was not in that cohort, unfortunately. I was in the refractory group. After going through a couple of different treatments that didn't work as well as we would have liked, it was coming up senior year and I had metastasized from the chest over to liver and abdomen. And it reached a point where it became the cycle of let's just get enough time to get to the next drug release that could potentially work. Meanwhile, like everyone who had graduated with her, you know, they were moving out of their homes and they were working and, you know, when is that gonna be my turn? I was starting to get more sick at this point. I was in a lot of pain. I had lost so much weight from not being able to like really keep down food or liquids or anything. I was just so exhausted after all of the treatments. I wasn't particularly optimistic. So this was a 23-year-old girl with a, a, a refractory cancer. Uh, that for, for which she had gotten 14 prior treatments. And uh, when she came into the clinic, I never, I didn't actually ever see her really stand. She was pretty much gray. And I really felt at the time that, you know, this was a real long shot. She received a dose. I saw her the following week. She was just as sick, but a smidgen less. Over time, you know, maybe in about three or four weeks, I actually realized how tall she was. The only thing I experienced is maybe like some mild fatigue. Otherwise, there was like really no nausea or anything else to get in the way from me getting better. I was really able to start, you know, thinking about working again and you know, just building up my energy and feeling well and hanging out with friends and things. It wasn't my entire life anymore. Now she comes in, she's got her laptop, she's hanging out, she's going to work, she's got her life back. This is about a, a year and a half later. It was wow. Even with the treatment not being in my body right now, it still continues to fight off the cancer cells and keep the lymphoma at bay. The idea that there could be a treatment that just harnesses the body's own defenses, it's like now we have much better detectives on the case. You have immunotherapies that can be adapted across multiple cancers. It just opens up the toolbox and there are so many more options for so many more people. Learn as much as you can, and you connect with other folks that really care about it. They're all out there, and they're all actively sharing and tweeting and talking about it. I'm so grateful for all the folks that are fundraising and actively raising awareness through the Cancer Research Institute and everyone associated with that that gets it from the initial stages of research to the clinical trials all the way over to folks like me who, after failing a couple other trials, are looking for the next option. Hi everyone. <laughs> so that was me. <laughs> I, I feel so grateful to be here today with all of you. Um, yeah, no, that, uh, that was filmed almost uh, four years ago in October 2015, uh, released in 2016, um, when Optivo, nivolumab that I was uh, treated with, uh, was approved for Hodgkin lymphoma, um, which was really wild to be able to participate that, see that, and then have this be documented as part of that approval. And it's also crazy to see you know, just how far you know, I've come since that was filmed, um, how much has changed, how much has stayed the same. Um, for me, um, as you mentioned in the, in the film, 
um, you know, I'm a cancer patient. I have or, or had, I'm still not really sure what the proper tense is, Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, people ask me if I'm like in remission, if I'm you know, still sick. Um, and while I don't honestly feel super comfortable using the R word, remission, um, technically there, we have NED, no evidence of disease, which is really cool. I can, I'm comfortable with that one. Um, stable is good. That one I'm also super comfortable with. Um, it's been almost five years now since my last treatment, which is super crazy. Um, <laughs> nuts. Thank you. Uh, two weeks ago, I was sitting in a patient room at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center where I'd been treated since the beginning. Um, a fellow came in um, before I took books to my oncologist, and um, you know she was talking about asking me some questions, seeing how I was feeling, and um, talking about some of the, the scan results for a little bit. And then she showed me my chart, and on it was a post-it that said survivorship eligible, which just crazy to think about. Um, from where I was to where I am today. Um, so when I think about like my status, like NED, whatever, I am at least survivorship eligible, which is pretty cool. My oncologist then came in and um, it was largely a social visit as they are today. Like we tend to just kind of chat a little bit, you know, get some hugs in there. Um, and we talk about scan results. So, you know, as of two weeks, things are still great, which is awesome. Um, well, what we did talk about was um, this idea of like what happens next. Uh, I've been going there for almost nine, like almost nine years now. Um, he's like, "What am I gonna do with you? <laughs> what like like do I keep scanning you?" And I'm just kind of like, I don't know. Like, can't ask me to make this decision. Like, we're just kind of going down this path here, like trying to figure this out. Um, it's, it's a very, it's exciting and, you know, and challenging at the same time to figure out the right move here. You say he's going to talk to some people, see what the right follow-up is for someone who's, you know, four and a half, almost five years out of treatment. So we might continue doing scans. We might just, you know, have me come in, say hi, see what's going on. Um, and while that does sound really nice, like potentially like not getting scanned and having be like, you know, uh, crystal light, raspberry flavored jungle juice kind of thing every six months, which again, I have been getting used to, especially when they make it nice cold, you know, it could be a nice little, little summer drink there. Um, I am also at the same time, like wondering what it would be like to have like a scan this future, like not going through this thing <laughs> um, every few months or so. I had almost looked at this as like a safety net of sorts. Um, this idea that like no matter what I was feeling, if I had, you know, a little bit of a cold, some allergies, I got, I got the flu in March. I always knew that, like, a scan was coming up. We're going to get stuff checked out. We're going to get the lay of the land here. Um, always had that to look forward to. Um, and then I, could, then I could relax after that status update. In thinking about that, thinking about this future where imaging might play less of a role in my life, I then you know, started to think about the beginning. Um, when I was first diagnosed. So it's, it's wild. Um, so I was diagnosed um, in 2010. I was 20 years old. Um, now 29, I'm reflecting on it, almost a third of my life has been spent in some kind of like cancer treatment or follow-up. Like we used to joke about this, some relationship with Sloan is the longest lasting relationship I've ever been in. But, um, you know, it's been, it's been, they've been really good to me. So uh, it's all good. <laughs> um, I would say my 20-year-old self, you know, there's a lot of similar similarities. We were both as equally bouncy and enthusiastic. But I think one thing that dif differentiates me from my younger self, um, I was, like, not good at taking care of my health. I would be up at all hours, studying, like, drinking coffee, going out. Um, I was not good at prioritizing my health. I had a very, I also had a very specific view about what success looked like, largely driven by attending a pre-professional university. Um, I just knew very little about the world and everything in it. 
Um, I started to notice my symptoms in the spring of 2010. Um, I had a roommate at the time and would find myself waking up in the middle of the night with this hacking cough. You know, bless her, she didn't kick me out of our room. <laughs> she's even, she's still friends with me today. We actually, we went to uh, Machu Picchu together to go hiking last year, um, which is really wonderful. Um, at any rate, this, this cough continued um, from the spring into the summer. Um, I was going to the beach, I was running around, I was interning, um, and all the while I still had this cough. I had my internship, I was spending the day making spreadsheets, you know, writing press releases, and just coughing. I went to see my pediatrician about like five times or so and was told it could be attributed to a variety of ailments. It could be my asthma that would be weird given that like I had asthma and was like a county metal hurdler and, and high jumper in high school. Um, it could have been allergies, that I might be a touch of pneumonia for a little while. Cancer was never brought up. And we never did any screening beyond like a physical exam. Um, I, you know, like, meanwhile, I was unable to sleep through the night and I was a bit embarrassed <laughs> that I might be known at work as like the coughing girl, not something that someone wants or trying to get a full-time job. Um, I went from doing long runs around the Schuylkill River um, down in Philly uh, to being unable to go 50 feet without wheezing. Um, so I complained to my mom. She's, she's here listening to me complaining for years. Thanks for that. Um, so I was, you know, really frustrated and saying, like, something's up. Like, I'm doing everything they're telling me to do, and nothing is working. Um, this was a key point when I had to advocate for myself. I knew something was off. So she set me up with her adult person doctor, and from there, um, I was sent to get a chest x-ray. And I still remember the phone call um, when this doctor called me to come in to talk about the results. I, um, you know, I, I knew, imagine that something must be, must be serious if she's asking me to come in. Um, I just didn't know what it would be. So I came in, um, and she said there was a mass the size of my fist um, outside of my right lung. I remember making a fist with my hand just looking at it, and I was just perplexed that something this large could fit under my skin, and I wouldn't notice it. And then I was thinking back to the difficulty my lungs were having at taking in air, and I was just amazed at how my body was able to adapt to that so that I could keep, keep on keeping on. Um, some days later, I had the first of three biopsies that would diagnose me. Um, the local hospital um, had some difficulty getting sufficient tissue the first time. There was apparently a lot of necrotic, or, or as I learned there, dead tissue floating around up in my chest. Um, we did a needle biopsy later that day. Um, we were able to figure out it was lymphoma, but we weren't sure what type. So not off to the best start. Um, but fortunately, through a family friend, I got connected to the folks at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, um, where I met my oncologist for the first time. I was totally freaking out. Um, you know, my dad was there with this big yellow legal pad, just like furiously driving down notes. My mom was there with this giant binder of like stuff, records, and like CDs, scans, asking a million questions. Um, but one thing that like, immediately like put me at ease with my doctor, I made me think that we like we would get along through this, was um, I was I was really frustrated that I was gonna get a third biopsy and that I was worried that like we had wasted a bunch of time. Um, and I just was worried that I didn't have time to like, wonder really want to get this treatment started. And he was like, listen, like, you're not a ticking time bomb. He leans into me, listens to my chest. He's like, I don't hear any ticking. <laughs> so I was like, we're going to be able to hang out. This is going to be good. I needed that dry sense of humor, um, to get through this. Um, and then, you know, it went from, you know, running around to, Becoming, also, by the way, if you guys don't follow the cancer patient on Instagram, I highly recommend. So, you know, I went from this idea, like, okay, so this is what I have to do to be a model patient. And then I just started, like, you know, shoving down a bunch of cake. And I got to tell you, it, it really works. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know I was really lucky that um, uh, I was able to continue going to school um, during my first treatment. Um, my oncologist supported me um, in continuing um, to go to school. I thought that a semblance of normalcy would be really helpful. Um, and so we worked out having like, a reduced workload. Um, I was able to you know, have my friends um, close by. Um, they even came with me when I got my wig fitted, and we made it into like a social visit. Went into the Terrell Back Zoo afterward. 
saw some cool snakes. It was, it was good. It was a good day. I'll remember it for the day we went to the zoo rather than the day I got my wig. My, I was you know, still going out. This was at a frat party. Got my Greek sweat t-shirt. I was not going to let it hold me back from living my life. <laughs> um, and honestly, with the treatment, I was mostly worried, again, being this hyper-competitive school, I was mostly worried about taking time off and, like, it impacting my, my plans to, like, work at a you know, big, fancy company and, like, make buckets of money. Um, and I, you know, wanted to make sure I was able to manage all of that. So, again, we thought it, would just going, it was just going to take place over the course of the semester. Minor interruption to my, to my plans, my grand plans. Um, but as we, you know, completed that first course of chemo, it was supposed to be just a two-step process, frontline chemo and radiation, and then it was supposed to be done, like 90% of Hodgkin lymphoma patients are. Um, but when we finished chemo and I was getting mapped for the radiation, that was when we discovered that the frontline chemo hadn't worked as we had thought it would. It's literally, like, on the table... Um, they were mapping me out, making, giving me a little, my little tattoos. Anyone that's had radiation had those little, those little dots. Um, and I was really frustrated. I remember I had like a final exam essay that I was supposed to write that night and I just couldn't do it. I just like cried myself to sleep and started again the next day. That was the first in a string of failed treatments, um, that came my way, um, you know, from ICE to GND, um, starting to go down the path of more targeted treatments and clinical trials. It was after radiation um, when, uh, this this was during um, a summer internship in 2011. Um, At that time, we were just doing radiation to the upper mantle. I still had that wig. You know, it was like getting a little worse for wear. I was like really wearing it out. Um, I had my nice like radiation magic marker that they used to put some stickers over it. It looks really cool. I go out to the club. Um, People thought I was in a cult. It's fine. Um, The best cult, really. Um, It was after this radiation that we noticed that my cancer had metastasized. So it had spread from my chest to my abdomen and liver. So it was kind of like, well, all right, uh, let's go find some other options. Um, we started with SGN 35, um, some other clinical trials. Fortunately, a lot of those I was able to do through Sloan as well. Um, one such treatment, Cal 101, did end up buying me a ton of time. Um, so I was able to join my senior year spring. Um, I went to Italy with my mom for spring break. Um, run around like fools. Um, I was able to graduate on time um, while managing this treatment. Um, and it really just gave me this like glimmer of like what a future without cancer life would be like. Unfortunately, the response was short-lived. Um, and after uh, graduation, um, instead of taking the full-time job um, that I would have gotten from the internship where I was getting radiation, I became a clinical trial consultant of sorts for myself. Um, so this involved um, becoming more actively involved in deciding what treatments that I was going to get, um, since Sloan did not have anything for me at that time. Um, so, you know, true to form, as someone who studied behavioral economics, I made a decision matrix um, to help me figure out, you know, what trial or what treatment to sign up for. Um, so I, I picked a bunch of attributes that I thought were important to me, um, like convenience was a factor, like the, the safety of it with, with the phases, um, how the treatment frequency, where it was located, um, the drug delivery. Um, I always hated needles, so I was like, oral medication would be much nicer if I can make that work. Um, and I plotted them out. And with, in consultation with my oncologist, um, f- prioritized which ones we reach out to first. And that's when I got involved in this whole process of trying to get on a trial, not at the site where I was being, being currently treated. It involved you know, calling different clinical trial coordinators, um, trying to schedule consultations, trying to get all my paperwork together so I could get, um, you know, get some appointments in place so they could look at me before I can even um, proceed with going through some qualifying tests to get, onto, uh, get, a, get a spot in a clinical trial cohort. Um, it reminded me of just kind of going through like an interview process with trying to get like a first job. You know, you apply to a bunch of places, you, they hope like your resume, and then maybe they'll come in and see you. Um, and if you qualify, you know, you could get, you know, something that will make your life better. Um, and through that, I, you know, was able to participate in some clinical trials, um, that got me through to the end of 2012, um, 
with clinical trials generally, and you'll know this, and this was also mentioned on the panel here today, um, with newer, particularly experimental treatments, like every symptom that you notice, even the most subtle, is really important to share. This was something, this kind of training I'd become honed on where I was like, okay, like, that thing I was just feeling, was that, like, normal tire, not normal tire? Like, I should probably write it down. Like, there's a weird little cough, write this down. And then I had, like, a laundry list of stuff to share with the clinical trial people every time I came back. I was like, but what about this oddly specific thing where I felt, like, a little bit tired at 10 a.m., but not at 9? And, like, that is very helpful to keep writing it down. And they were like, I don't know if it's as relevant, but they humored me, which is good. Um, there are also things that, again, like, you got to be really comfortable with your physician. At one time, I was waiting uh, in the waiting room to be seen, and there was this, like, really cute guy. I was also a cancer patient sitting across the way from me, and I was distracted, and poop my pants right there in the waiting room. So I had to go hide out in the bathroom. My mom came and got some scrubs from the nurses. And uh, that was an important note that day in my, uh, in my trial log. So everything matters, even the most embarrassing things. Share it all. Um, another piece that I you know, just learned through going through this clinical trial process was the importance of asking you for help, which sometimes involves literally asking for new pants. Um, whatever it is, like there are people there that are down to help you. Um, and it's important that we ask all the questions, no matter how um, silly they may seem at the time. Um, it's important that you as the patient have clarity and feel comfortable and feel empowered with the knowledge so that you can help progress things forward. Um, it was at that time that we reached you know, sort of the, the, the lowest point in my cancer journey, which was you know, winter 2012 going into 2013. So... Um, by the numbers, uh, that involved one stay in the ICU, um, about 30 pounds um, of, of fluid and, and tumor and stuff in my stomach that I carried around. Um, and I was on about 60 milligrams of Oxycontin twice a day, was still with brake fluid pain. It was a really difficult um, part of my life. ICU, I would be watched 24 hours a day by the angels of our health system, these nurses, um, and knowing that I had this care team behind me in my lowest of points is what made it possible for me to navigate that um, and feel, still feel hopeful. My ankles and feet had swollen. It made it difficult to wear most of my clothes to shoes. It was wintertime. Um, I, was, I was miserable. I would wake up wondering when I can go back to sleep. Um, I didn't want to eat, talk to friends, uh, go outside. I barely had energy to go on the computer, which is wild now. I could literally, like, do web design. Um, but um, I remember I had a visiting nurse come, and she was, like, flushing my catheter. And, um, you know, I was sitting there, and I, and I had this giant stomach from everything being backed up. And I remember she asked when I was due because she thought I was pregnant. And for someone who had stopped getting my periods and I was having hot flashes, that was not an easy conversation to have. Um, as last ditch effort, you know, we put, my, my oncologist put me on CMOP, which is, um, for those that have read Emperor of Maladies, which I would highly recommend, um, is one of the first protocols that was developed, um, for lymphoma, um, back in like the 60s or so, um, falls like a mustard gas derivative. So literally the last missile in the arsenal that we had to fire at this thing. And it did work for a time. It cleared out my stomach. Um, I was feeling a little bit better. Um, I could start wearing my normal shoes, which was very exciting. Um, but it wasn't done. So I was starting to get better. Again, like my stomach, um, I, with the cancer involved in my abdomen and my liver, um, I was starting to develop some blockages. Um, so in the spring of 2013, it was um, trying to figure out how to keep food down, um, going to the hospital occasionally. Um, one point I had a more severe blockage where um, I was like hiding out in the Port Authority bathroom in a ton of pain. Um, and my friend and some EMS people had to come get me, put me in an ambulance and bring me to Sloan. Um, to get checked out. Um, but one of the major blockages I had ended up being a really good thing. And I say that because it brought me back into the hospital and I had to get a surgery to fix, um, to fix my bowel. My, my intestine wasn't doing like the squeezy, pushy thing it's supposed to be doing. Um, so when they scanned me for this surgery, they uncovered some weird stuff in my liver. And mind you, I had just finished CMOP. So we thought we were like 
good. You were done. And but they were like, you know, maybe maybe it's an infection. Like, well, just let's vet it out. Let's not assume it's the film right away. So they did some cultures. They checked it for bacterial and fungal infections. No dice. So the most plausible explanation was that it was lymphoma. So it was the fastest it would have grown and come back um, in in that time, which was very alarming. We proceeded with the surgery. Um, you know, got put on a liquid diet, just hanging out. Um, and my oncologist came to visit me at my bedside, and we were talking through like what we were going to do, um, because as far as I was concerned, like I had exhausted all of my options. But he was like, you know, there's this other clinical trial. Um, it's very early um, here at Sloan. Um, this thing called a uh, PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor um, called nivolumab. And he was explaining to me, you know, some of the science behind it, similar to what Dr. Bearden was talking about well, earlier, giving us our PhDs. Um, that was a lot of what he was explaining to me and how it was going to help stimulate the immune system, which was intriguing to me, um, as a lot of the past treatments I had had, um, you know, were these like broad-based chemotherapies or, or radiation, more tumor targeting things, and they didn't work. So trying this completely different approach um, was appealing. And knowing that it would have different kinds of side effects to what I experienced with chemotherapy um, was definitely something I was down for <laughs> at that point. Um, so, you know, the hospital stayed the highlights, so I got a fancy new scar. Um, we discovered the FOMA had come back, and I learned about nivolumab. So, all in all, not a bad way to go for two weeks, hanging out at Sloan. So, you know, as Dr. Reardon explained, and what my oncologist explained to me, um, it prevents this interaction um, that shuts down the immune system and stops it from doing its job. So, again, having had failed so many other treatments, um, I was having difficulty keeping down food. Um, I was frustrated and I was beat down, but you know I was still I was still ready to go. Like let's let's try this new thing. So the day after I left the hospital, went back to Sloan, got met, met up with a new clinical trial team, Dr. Lasokan, who you saw in the video. Um, met him, and as he had mentioned in the video, I was just this hebel little thing, green and shriveled up, um, still fighting. <laughs> so. We hung out, um, I got qualified for the trial, and we started the infusions. And I remember Dr. Lasokin, again, I had gone through so many treatments at that point, and so many things that had been hyped up to me as like, that would be game changers, and I was just really not there for another sales pitch. And he was perfect. Again, similar kind of dry humor to my other oncologist. Um, he didn't overpromise anything. He was like, this is the evidence we've seen, these are the other cancers that's worked in before, and we think it's a viable candidate to potentially work for Hodgkin lymphoma patients such as yourself. Let's give it a shot. And that was exactly the type of tone and temperament I needed at that point in time. And my early results were promising. And I think the best way, when I would explain immunotherapy to my friends, um, when I started to get early results that were positive, um, you know, I came up with a bunch of different silly ideas. And as a millennial, I felt it's really important to explain it through memes. So my memes and before immunotherapy, we have, you know, Darth Vader, I'm here to ruin your life. And then he's like, I'm tired, like, leave me alone. But then after immunotherapy, he's like, come at me, bro. Like, let's, let's throw down. So that's where I'm at. Um, but these early results were the same time, like feeling good right away, I was very skeptical. Because again, I had seen this before. I had had drugs that started to work early on and then had stopped working. So I had a very um, tempered optimism, I will say. And so my early results came back and like, like over 50% had been wiped out. That was really exciting. But again, tempered excitement. I was just like, is this, again, is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Don't know, but we're gonna keep trying and we're gonna keep winging it. Um, I was happy, though, that, you know, going from being in the hospital, this is the hospital say, um, <laughs> they had pet therapy, which was awesome, um, and feeling super weak. Within a matter of, like, six to eight weeks, I was outside. I went to my first year reunion. I saw some of my friends graduate. Like, this was the life that immunotherapy was enabling for me. Um, so from there, um, I was thinking about, you know, some of the, the side effects that I come to expect from chemotherapy, and I look, they liken it to Brick Tamlin. Um, I don't you guys remember from Anchorman, they get into this fight. 
And so Brick gets a trident, and he's just waving it wildly and, like, hitting anything in its path, indiscriminately, nonspecific. Um, which, again, and it can work and can, you know, can kill some cancer stuff. But what you really want is Nico Montoya, who knows exactly who he's looking for, hunts him down, and then has the skills, this little sword, to knock it out. I have to explain everything in movies. That's the only way. <laughs> um, so for me, now, looking back and thinking about you know, where I was, it, the initial successes I saw with immunotherapy, I ended up being on it from like 2013 through the end of 2014. Um, there were some side effects you know, along the way, um, but pretty minor compared to what I'd seen with chemotherapy, and I know it's different for everyone. And again, all the more reason to pay attention to your symptoms and report them to your physician. Um, I had things like pneumonitis. Um, we managed that. I had a liver enzyme spike. We ended up deciding to stop omnivolumab because of that. But at that point, I think like almost like, like over, well over like 96% of the um, cancer cells had been wiped out. So, you know, and I was eligible to receive treatment again if I needed it. So it felt like the right time to make that move. And we've just been kind of like watching and waiting ever since. Um, so I've been able to like climb on some stuff now, frolicking around in the sun, hanging out with Cancer Research Institute people. I organize UX hackathons now. But ultimately, like going through this experience, I didn't do this alone. And I, I know we talked about that a little bit in the video and what's been mentioned here as well. Um, it's clinical resources, it's transportation and logistics, it's financial support, it's friends and family. All of these things made this possible. Um, so just to walk through some of them really quickly. So at a general glance, um, clinicaltrials.gov, which many of you are probably very familiar with, um, that's where I learned about a lot of the trials that um, I was on um, pre-immunotherapy um, clinical trial. Um, the, it's much more user-friendly now than <laughs> when I used it, which is great. I recommend checking it out to see what options are available to you, see what clinical trial sites are, are, um, are uh, recruiting and to share those with your physician and figure out some other options. So I recommend cancerresearch.org. They have um, some uh, clinical trial navigators, and there's some here today as well. A little shout out. Um, from a transportation and logistics standpoint, again, it's not just treatments. It's like, how do you get to those treatments? How do you make sure that you're, you are, you know, not, not stressing yourself out even more than, than necessary navigating this process? Um, when I was getting uh, radiation, um, I was doing an internship in Hartford, Connecticut, again, away from home. But fortunately, thanks to the Road to Recovery um, volunteers through American Cancer Society, I always had a ride, um, and I didn't have to worry about that. Um, when I was going to clinical trial sites outside of New York, um, Corporate Angels was an amazing resource. Um, what it does is it gets cancer patients um, seats on flights, um, so you don't have to pay uh, when you go from trial site to trial site. And then from a community standpoint, um, a lot of Facebook groups are really helpful to me. Um, there's certainly other types of forums as well. Um, there's a lot of disease-specific ones. The one in particular that I that was worked for me, again, having someone with refractory disease, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma relapse and refractory. I share a lot of tips and just a great place to vent and just talk and communicate with other patients. Um, also, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society ties um, for young adults. And then... Man, which I recently discovered, I wish this was available when I was getting sick because I, I needed this, this, bright, uh, this bright light of humor, um, the cancer patient um, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and then just some general learnings, um, things that I have observed, um, the importance of valuing your options. So like I did my decision matrix and I made my little chart because that's, that's how my brain works. Um, but whatever, whatever your method is, um, to figure out like wh how, what you will prioritize when you're picking what type of trial or what type of treatment or what type of, of clinician or, or clinic you're going to go to, those are your those are things that are personal to you. Um, and there are there there are options like the dry humor that like my oncologist had might not work for some people. It was great for me. That's what I needed. Um, but again, the bedside manner that your physician has will influence how comfortable you are, you are sharing your side effects. And that's important to think through. And you want to make sure you find a good, good match. Um, in addition to that, you have to own your experience. Um, 
the data points that you provide as patients and that we prov I provided as patients are your day-to-day -day experience. Your clinicians and your nurses, um, your clinical trial coordinators aren't there with you every day. They didn't, like, they, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna know like, if it was hard for you to get out of bed that morning. They're not going to know if you were having, like, you shake your pants in the waiting room, actually. They might know that. Um, these are things that you need to document and own and know that the insights that you're providing about your experience going through these treatments um, is a critical part of your recovery and know that and feel empowered by that. And again, I think when we're navigating this and it can feel very overwhelming and it can feel like, um, you know, we don't have the expertise to navigate this and it can feel confusing, you can know that the, at the end of the day, you at least know how you feel. And that can be a really key part in this. And that was very empowering to me. Um, and also that you're not alone. Um, as we can look around the room when, you know, Brian had everyone raise their hands to see, you know, who were the patients and caregivers in the audience, there, there's a lot of us um, that are navigating this, a lot of whom, you know, have, have gone through um, clinical trials and gone through immunotherapy, have different experiences to share and talk through. Um, in addition to that, you know, the caregivers and the family members that are here um, and the friends that we have and the, the nonprofits that are solely designed to make our lives easier. Um, those are resources we can tap into, places like CRI. And finally, like, you, know, you can handle this. Um, when I went through my four years of treatment and then like, you know, almost five years post now, um, yeah, I, I struggled a lot. And in the beginning, I felt really ill-equipped to handle this. I was having difficulty managing my stress, um, but thanks to like, a lot of different um, like therapies, acupuncture, holistic doctors, my oncologist's weird jokes, um, and more, able to navigate it. Um, and so you guys can do the same. And so I just want to say like how, again, how grateful I am to be here today. And I'm just feel really blessed that there has been so many researchers and clinicians and patients and caregivers and supporters that have come before me that allowed me to be here today and who were involved in trials before I was, which enabled me to be on the trial that I was on. And I'm happy that I'm able to play this small role in making it so other patients can have the same quality of life that I've been able to have in the future. Um, and I know that a lot of that's going to come down to continuing to investigate and develop new options and new drugs so that more patients with more different types of cancers can benefit. And it's important that we continue to fundraise and drive and support and share our stories so that those drugs can continue to be developed and so that more patients can receive the care that they need. <sighs> but yeah, and I'm just looking forward to the day when, again, more of us can be out and about climbing on stuff, frolicking around in the sun, thanks to immunotherapy and other innovations in cancer care. So thank you.